This video will present some of my thoughts on the famous paper On the Measure of Intelligence by Francois Cholet. This video will explore the levels of generalization, the cognitive hierarchy and existence of a G-factor shared ability across these different cognitive tasks, core knowledge and human priors, Cholet's criticism of AI benchmarks, and a quick introduction to the ARC challenge. Particularly in this video, I think it's interesting to look at how data augmentation paired with generative models can help us move from local to broad generalization. Thanks for watching. I hope this video is a good introduction to the paper and stay tuned for Tim, Yannick and I's discussion on Machine Learning Street Talk about this paper. This video will present a quick overview of one of the most interesting papers in deep learning and artificial intelligence. On the Measure of Intelligence by Francois Chalet. On the Measure of Intelligence is a pretty long paper, so here's a quick overview of some of the topics that will be presented in this video. We'll start off with Chalet's view of generalization, the difference between system-aware and developer-aware generalization, and viewing the developer of the machine learning algorithm as a part of the system that's being evaluated with respect to generalization. Cholet also describes levels of generalization, the bare minimum being absent generalization, which is the case of, say, tic-tac-toe, where you can just enumerate all the possible board states, so there's really no generalization in the system, then going up to local, to broad, and extreme generalization. Personally, my research interests are in data augmentation and generative modeling, so I'm really excited to connect the, this kind of area of research, things like DermGAN and these data augmentation techniques, with this view of generalization. Then we'll look at the cognitive hierarchy. Chalet describes this G factor that's used in psychometric tests to try to find a common ability of all these different uh, performances on IQ tests. A good example with this is in physical fitness. So say you have a state-of-the-art or world-class uh, marathon runner, bench presser, and basketball player. You'd expect them to all have this common physical ability like lung capacity or something like that. So they're trying to find this common factor that's present in all these different cognitive tasks. Then we'll look at human priors and core knowledge. The definition of intelligence that comes out of this paper is skill acquisition efficiency over a scope of tasks with respect to priors, experience, and generalization difficulty. So Chalet defines these different priors and now humans have these priors that have been illustrated in core knowledge. Things like our uh, understanding of agentness, object permanence, and these different things. So we're trying to connect the human priors with our machine learning algorithms as priors. So things like uh, the convolutional neural network or data augmentation or consistency regularization are all examples of priors that we put into our machine learning algorithms and we're trying to compare this with the human priors so that we can define intelligence as the efficiency with respect to these priors. So we'll look further at this definition of intelligence and you know defining this scope, this idea of algorithmic information theory and compressing the solution. Then we'll look at uh, Chalet's criticism of benchmarks like he favors the animal AI Olympics over other benchmarks like say ImageNet or the super glue multitask kind of benchmark. Then finally, we'll look at the ARC challenge, this kind of a few shot generative modeling task where you have a few examples of pu puzzles and their completions, and you have to infer the completion of a novel puzzle. The first definition of generalization presented in the paper is the difference between system-centric generalization and developer-aware generalization. So I think it's useful to think about this in the context of known cross unknowns with respect to these novel encounters that we're gonna expect our system to face. So a known knowns is say in the dog versus cat classification challenge, we have all the different types of dog breeds and cats, and these are our known knowns. We're not gonna introduce any new dog breeds or any new types of cats into the system. So a, non, a known unknown would be as, as if us as the developers know this new dog breed that we're going to introduce to the system. And we already know in advance that we're expecting this kind of a gap as it sees this new dog. So by knowing the unknowns, we can do things like data augmentation with generative models, which we're going to look at later in the presentation with things like DermGAN, which are using these non known unknowns to construct additional data samples that will help our classifier generalize to known unknowns. Unknown knowns might be the priors in the system. So this isn't quite related to generalization, but I just wanted to fill out the table. So an unknown knowns might be a prior in the machine learning algorithm that we're not paying enough attention to, or maybe it could be a prior in our own human priors that we're not accounting for that needs to be cooked into the system. And then unknown unknowns is this idea of developer-aware generalization. This is where the dichotomy shifts from system-centric to developer-aware. Unknown unknowns is something that even us as the developer aren't aware of this shift that's gonna happen. And it's a little hard to imagine this with things like cat versus dog classifiers, but if you think of a self-driving car, it might be really hard to anticipate what kind of situation the car is going to end up in and how it's going to need to uh, generalize to these novel situations. 
So now let's shift the focus to levels of generalization. A tic-tac-toe player has no generalization. It just enumerates the entire board space and it doesn't need to generalize to any kind of novel situation. Now the lines blur between local and broad generalization. An example of failed local generalization could be something like adding a noise map to a cat image and then it classifies it as a dog. This kind of adversarial example perturbation. And then it could go to say rotating the image and causing a misclassification, shifting it, or introducing a new cat breed. So it's tough to define the difference between local and broad because it's kind of like when you solve chess, now it's not intelligent. Local to broad is kind of like as you solve this local generalization problem, the uh, benchmark is gonna shift out and people aren't gonna view that as uh, generalization anymore. And it becomes like you need to do this broader task to be more impressive. But this diagram depicts it well where say these are the golden retrievers and other kinds of dogs and we have this local generalization where we can view a, a golden retriever from a different angle or uh, you know like a different action pose and then this broader generalization would say you could introduce like a new dog breed because now it's covering more of this kind of uh, space and then extreme generalization is this really dramatic thing where it can generalize to situations that we aren't even aware of as the developers of the system so i'd like to point you in the direction of dermgan to see how our machine learning algorithms are going to get better at doing known unknown generalization blurring the line from local to broad generalization so in DermGAN, we have these images of skin lesions, and there are all sorts of different unknowns that we know are in our data set. For example, the size of the skin lesion, the uh, lighting conditions of the image, and then the skin color of the background. So this is like a picture of like a mole on somebody's arm. So we know these unknowns in our data set. So we can use, in this case, it's a pix to pix generative model, which is the image to image translation kind of model that we're using to match from these semantic maps, kind of like in the Gaugan model, how they go from, uh, they draw these pixel maps and they generate photorealistic landscapes from them. They're using these semantic maps to increase the size of the skin lesion, uh, change the skin color and change the lighting conditions so that they can account for the known unknowns in the data set. You see this image that comes out has a uh, better lighting than the original image. Another really interesting paper in this space is on the steerability of generative adversarial networks. This paper is looking at how we can find these images that have these augmentations in the latent space of a trained generative model. So this generative model hasn't been trained on this zoomed in dog face. It's just been trained on this first image, like the ImageNet images. And it can, you can use the latent space to construct these augmentations. So it's a really interesting case of how we can leverage our generative models like GANs or variational autoencoders to construct new data that we can put into the data set and now have this class balance for our known unknowns. Like we know in advance that you might get a dog image that's just the face. So maybe we can search for these zooms in the latent space of our generative model and then augment the data set with the, this data so it has this prior to know that uh, we're gonna expect a zoomed in picture of a dog's face at the generalization test case. Here are two examples that I think are really useful to help think about generalization. The first of which is game playing AIs like chess. So this chess algorithm might be really good at playing against other really good chess players. But what often happens with things like the Dota 2 uh, algorithm is that once the researchers open source the model and people start playing around with it, they'll find some adversarial policy or some way of playing that can corrupt the chess system or the uh, Dota 2 agent. So even though this adversarial example is playing against really great players, it has to be generalized to playing against all sorts of different players. So this kind of adversarial generalization, I think is a bit different from something like the Wozniak's coffee cup test. So the Wozniak coffee cup test is this idea that a robot could go into any kitchen and make a cup of coffee. So this generalization would be say, you know, the lighting conditions, the layout of the rooms, the, how the coffee machine is going to work. And then like the coffee cup itself, the shape of it, the color of it, all this kind of visual variation. And in addition to maybe saying the robot itself has variation in its actuators. Maybe it has like a six degree of freedom hand compared to 11 degrees and all sorts of different ways it can apply forces on the hand. So you can imagine all these different kinds of generalization that makes something like the Wozniak's coffee cup test hard, even harder if you're talking about an intelligence that can go into any robot in any kind of uh, actuator system and then generalize to making a cup of coffee. So I think it's interesting to think about this kind of generalization compared to an adversarial game playing type of generalization. So in my opinion, local to broad generalization is really just a single one dimensional metric. So from zero being local and 10 being broad, where I think something like a generative models data augmentation could overcome going from local to broad generalization on most of these uh, vision language and speech tasks that we're interested in. 
But something like extreme generalization is a bit more ambitious and hard to define. This is this idea of unknown unknowns. And I think the best example of this is the POET algorithm. The POET algorithm is a simple framework-ish compared to this grandiose idea of extreme generalization. But in this case, the, a the controller of the agent is being evolved as is the bipedal walking the terrain on which it's uh, gonna run on. So this kind of co-evolution enables this open-ended exploration where this algorithm could discover some unknown uh, walking terrain that the agent that some agent is going to learn how to walk on. So if you could imagine kind of blowing up this kind of a co-evolution search space, you could have this open-endedness where the algorithm is learning to solve problems that we could not have possibly thought of in advance as the developers of the algorithm. So now let's talk a bit about the cognitive hierarchy and finding the G factor or the general intelligence that's shared amongst all of the specific task uh, the skill-based programs. So we have all these little tasks, like say different IQ tests, and we'd imagine that there's a shared broad ability and then a general intelligence G factor. The best example explaining this, I think, is the physical fitness example, where you'd say have lung capacity at the top and then bench press, uh, like squatting, marathon running, and then like tennis skill. So you imagine some kind of G factor that we might expect all of our machine learning models that are performing, say, a visual classification task or a question answering task on many different data sets, abstractive summarization on many different data sets, would share this common uh, ability. So my big question with this is how are we gonna test for this ability? Is it like a black box input output kind of test? And if so, the problem to overcome is catastrophic forgetting. Because in our deep neural networks, as we take this agent that has this ability, and then we specialize it to do question answering on like a medical record data set, it's probably gonna forget all these other tasks. That's what happens with catastrophic forgetting and this issue of continual learning is that most neural networks, I think the state of the art right now is a paper learning to continually learn from the lab with Jeff Kloon and Kenneth Stanley and uh, the Uber lab. But this problem of catastrophic forgetting, I think is gonna be really hard for testing for a general shared input output task that all of these different models can perform. We might think of this G factor as being a prior in humans that we can all perform this task just as this prior in the structure of our brain or the encoding or something like that. So some things that are described in the paper are this idea of core knowledge, where psychologists are looking to find uh, common behaviors across humans or common abilities, and then define this as kind of the priors in humans. Things like object permanence, knowing that you know if you uh, put the shower curtain over the shampoo, if you move the shower curtain again, you expect the shampoo to still be there. And then things like agentness, where you assume that uh, some objects are inanimate and like a lamp and then other objects like other humans are agents with some kind of intention. And then this uh, fundamental idea of geometry, like two dimensional and three dimensional navigation and these natural numbers. So these are the core priors in humans. And we want to compare the priors that we have as humans to the priors that we're putting into our um, our neural network. So things like elementary geometry and topology, you could think of the local convolutional filter as being a similar kind of prior. The definition of intelligence that comes out of this paper is the skill acquisition efficiency as a function of priors, experience, and generalization difficulty. Priors are examples like the convolution layers in a convolutional neural network, even how the information is stored in the neural network structure itself, then things like different data augmentations we might apply to the images, like rotating them or shifting the blue color histogram, and other kind of priors like the learning rate, the optimizer. These are all examples of how we are biasing our intelligence system to produce these skill programs. So the skill programs is the product of the intelligence system, which is the algorithm for learning this ability. It's the combination of our gradient descent, our neural network information structure, and the different priors that we're additionally gonna to give to the task at hand. For example, object detection with something like a faster RCNN has this prior of first uh, doing the regions of interest and then filtering the regions of interest. So these are examples of how priors can make the task easier rather than doing end-to-end -end optimization. We can give it more priors and structure it differently and that makes it easier. So this definition of intelligence says, even if you can learn the task in say 10 examples or 10 uh, images or 10 uh, environment rollouts and reinforced learning task, if you have a ton of priors, that's not really intelligence compared to something that has less priors and can learn from less experience as well. So the next thing is experience, how much data we're learning from. And then this third part of the equation is generalization difficulty. And I think this is a really tricky thing to measure. Like how would you compare uh, going from a cats versus dogs classifier to classifying a new dog breed, that kind of generalization, compared to something like uh, playing the proc gen benchmark from OpenAI, where you're doing like maze navigation and suddenly you're tasked with a new kind of maze layout. So 
I think this generalization difficulty is still a pretty tricky thing to measure with respect to real world scenarios or even these academic benchmark kind of situations. So this overall framework describes the intelligent system. It produces the skill-based program, which is like the weights of a trained classifier. It is interacting with the task in a similar kind of framework as like a reinforced learning MDP, where it's getting a state, a reward, the score. And then the task is sending feedback back to our intelligent system, which could be, even the intelligent system could just be us as the machine learning development community. And we're getting the feedback for how this intelligent system pr produced this skill program for something like ImageNet classification. And we get the feedback and iterate producing usually more priors like um, consistency regularization, self-training with noisy student, or all these kinds of things. Cholet describes many ways to benchmark intelligent systems. We started off with the chess benchmark, which didn't really produce general intelligence or something that's applicable to a bunch of problems, but it did eventually produce mu0. And mu0 is this algorithm for learning a world model or a model of the transitions from state action pairs to the next state. It does this in the latent space and it uses the same planning as in the Monte Carlo tree search with this latent space model. So mu0 is, is applicable to things more than board games. You could definitely use it for robotic control and it'll probably be used for more industrial process control that need to do this kind of uh, model-based reinforcement learning. So Chalet discusses different benchmarks and ways of evaluating the intelligence of a system. We can have a human review like a Turing test with a chatbot, a white box analysis, which would be useful for something like tic-tac-toe where we can, or maybe even something a little broader than tic-tac-toe, but we can enumerate all the different scenarios and then have this complete analysis of how it's performing or we have our peer confrontation, which is where the chess agent is playing against another chess agent. But then most commonly in AI are these benchmarks, things like the image net classification accuracy. And then more recently, we're moving into multitask benchmarks, which Chalet actually still takes issue with. So super glue isn't just like a squad, Stanford question answering data set evaluation. It's also this suite of tasks. So things like the text to text transfer transformer is really good at it. You'd expect to fine tuned uh, GPT-3 to be really good at this where it has to do like Yelp sentiment review classification, tell if uh, there are duplicate questions in the core questions similarity data set, and then do things like natural language inference. So it's a suite of these tasks to evaluate the natural language understanding of a given model. And then we have the animal AI Olympics. And this is uh, Cholet's favorite evaluation uh, benchmark currently out there that he describes in the paper. And this is where the agent has to face these different scenarios like uh, trying to get the food where it's uh, behind a transparent cylinder, so it has to route around the cylinder. So you can play around with this benchmark yourself. You can actually play the games yourself by going to the Animal AI Olympics website. On the Measure of Intelligence presents the ARC Challenge that was a really popular competition in Kaggle. So the ARC Challenge is about completing these puzzles or finding the missing spot. So you look at this kind of puzzle and you imagine that this slot would fit in there. So the in the ARC challenge, the generative model gets three different guesses. And if any of them are right, it scores correctly on the benchmark. So this requires kind of understanding these concepts, like the red object is gonna move towards the blue and they're gonna uh, like collide with each other in this same way. So you'd give it be given a new tile, a new blue square and a new some red object. And you'd have to infer that they're gonna collide with each other in this same kind of way. So it's this challenge of all these kind of puzzles and we can, as humans, we can easily do this. None of these tasks are really that hard to uh, solve yourself, although this one is a bit of a visual nightmare. But most of the tasks like this one, you just kind of look at it and you can quickly understand the rule that's governing the next puzzle piece. Thanks for watching this quick overview of some topics in On the Measure of Intelligence and my opinions about them. I hope that this was a good introduction to the paper or at least some areas of it and helped you just start thinking about uh, this idea of skill acquisition efficiency as a function of priors, experience and generalization difficulty, and this idea of levels of generalization from absent, local, broad to extreme generalization. Thanks for watching and please subscribe to Henry AI Labs for more deep learning and AI videos. Mm -hmm.